Hello, and welcome to today's poem. It's uh, called Hawk Roosting by a poet called Ted Hughes. Um, and I have to say, this is one of my favourite poems <clears throat> of all time, because what it does in the poem is it uses an animal um, to mirror human characteristics. And it's very interesting because it shows us an awful lot about um, the animal kingdom, but perhaps even more about what it means to be a human, in particular, a leader. Let's get cracking. OK, so I'd like you to do a little bit of a thought experiment before we move into the poem. I'd like you to think about the animal kingdom. And just for a moment, could you pause the video? And I'd like you to think, which animal's the most kind? Which is the most honest? Which is the most devious or tricky? Which is the most arrogant? And which would you consider to be the most powerful? Just pause the video for a second and write down your answers. <clears throat> now, I don't know what you came up with. Perhaps for the most devious, you might have gone for a fox. Maybe you think a snake is arrogant. Um, maybe you think a tiger is, is powerful. Uh, perhaps an elephant is honest. Who knows? But we do tend to, as a human species, associate animals with certain types of human personalities or, or characteristics. Now, a hawk, a hawk is a is a bird of prey. It is an animal that has um, adapted through millions of years to become um, a, a predator, a hunter. Um, and hawks are particularly known for their incredible eyesight, which enables them to hunt very small animals um, on the forest floor. Now, let's have a look at the, the background um, to the poem and, and Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes was born in 1930 um, and grew up in the English countryside. He also served in the RAF as a young man. And I think it's important to recognise that there were two aspects of, of Hughes's life that are important. One, he grew up on the stories of his father and his uncle who had served um, on the front lines in the uh, first, first World War. Yet he himself had known military action in the RAF. So Hughes's poetry focuses on mankind's flaws, our mistakes, the, the things that are wrong with us. Um, and he looks at how those things are mirrored in the natural world. And perhaps he's making the implication that human beings are not as far removed from the animal kingdom as we might think we are. So the hawk is not only known for its, um, its eyesight, but it's also known for its intelligence. People can train hawks and also it's incredibly sharp um, eyesight and claws. In medieval times, hawks were, were used by kings and aristocrats for hunting, again, because they were such intelligent birds. We talk about people who um, might be considered to be hawk-eyed. It's a phrase that often used, and that suggests that they're observant. Often they notice things that other people don't. We also think about politicians being hawkish or hawk-like, which tends to mean that they are aggressive towards other countries, usually favouring military intervention, usually favouring war. Indeed, those leaders who are less aggressive and look to find peaceful solutions are often known as doves, interestingly. So let's have a read of the poem. When we're reading this poem, we have to, to remember that it's written from the hawk's eye perspective. It's written in the first person as a uh, dramatic monologue, as if the hawk is thinking these words. I sit in the top of the wood, my eyes closed. In action, no falsifying dream between my hooked head and hooked feet. Or in sleep 
rehearse perfect kills and eat. The convenience of the high trees. The air's buoyancy and the sun's ray are of advantage to me. And the earth's face upward for my inspection. My feet are locked upon the rough bark. It took the whole of creation to produce my foot. My each feather. Now I hold creation in my foot. Or fly up and revolve it all slowly. <laughs> I kill where I please because this is all mine. There is no sophistry in my body. My manners are tearing off heads. The allotment of death. For the one path of my flight is direct through the bones of the living. No arguments assert my right. The sun is behind me. Nothing has changed since I begun. My eye has permitted no change. I am going to keep things like this. <laughs> it's a very sinister ending, I'm sure you'll agree. Let's take a closer look then. We're going to look through it stanza by stanza. So here's the first stanza. Note the way that the poem begins with the personal pronoun I. It immediately indicates the egocentric nature of the hawk. Indeed, as you read through the poem, you'll notice many times I and my. Everything comes from the hawk's eye view. Notice also in that first line, it sits in the top of the wood. Now, hawks are well known for being um, creatures that, that live in wooded areas. So it's no wonder it will sit at the top, possibly of one of the highest trees. Look at the way, though, it's looking down at the world from a position of superiority. It's very much top of the food chain. My eyes closed. Notice that as well. It's almost doesn't need to open its eyes, does it? It's so in control. And then in the next line, no falsifying dream. So a falsifying dream would be a dream that um, that makes up things that, that are not there. Um, a dream that tries to make excuses for um, one's behaviour. And in this case, well, this hawk doesn't need to dream. It's already in a position of supreme power. OK, so there's that other point I made about it being calm and controlled. Let's roll on to stanza two then. The convenience of the high trees. So the, the hawk believes or feels that nature is kind of set up around it. Everything is designed for its own pleasure and ease. And it's certainly enjoying that. Look at the exclamation mark there. There's a real sense of satisfaction. Then as we move through the stanza, look at that last line. The earth's face upward for my inspection. Now, this is really important. Apologies. This is a really important quote because we're beginning to get the sense that the hawk is like a military leader. If you know anything about uh, leaders in the military, one of the things they will do is inspect their troops. And we get the sense that the hawk sees the rest of nature as as being one of its troops and expects nature to bow down and look up to the hawk and most importantly, obey its command. We also get a sense of the uh, hawk sort of godlike presence here. The earth is below the hawk once again. Let's look at stanza three. My feet are locked upon the rough bark. Now, I love the use of the verb locked here. They're not placed. The hawk will not loosen its grip on power. There is no way to unlock it. And then have a look at the next line. It took the whole of creation to produce my foot. 
So the hawk believes that many millions of years of evolution led to this pinnacle of evolution. This is the absolute top spot um, in the, um, it holds the absolute top spot in the sort of evolutionary hierarchy. This is the greatest creature ever designed by nature. So it um, suggests, but also notes the capital C in creation. You see it in the last line of this stanza as well. It probably means that um, the hawk is likening itself to God, God the creator. And then as we move through to the end, now I hold creation in my foot. The hawk believes it's so powerful, so godlike that it can almost play with the world. I think here it's talking about creation as being the earth. It holds everything. It is the supreme leader. Now, this is a good example of what we call hubris or excessive self-pride. So, so self-important. Moving on, stanza four. Have a look at the third line. There is no sophistry in my body. Now, sophistry um, refers to false arguments, dishonest arguments, where you try to perhaps justify yourself by giving, um, giving reasons that perhaps don't really add up. But in this case, the hawk says, I don't need to be to use sophistry. I can be honest. I am a ruthless killer. And that's that. I'm in charge. I'm not embarrassed about that. Look at the last line. My manners are tearing off heads. Now, hopefully your manners and my manners are things like saying please and thank you or opening the doors for people. But in the case of this this hawk, this tyrant, this ruthless tyrant, its manners are ripping off the heads of others. It's just a real another sign of its extreme violence. Now to stanza five, the allotment of death. So if you allot something, it means you choose. You make a decision between maybe a, a range of alternatives. And so the hawk decides what lives and what dies. Again, another example of the godlike imagery, because indeed it's God, um, religious people would believe, who chooses whether we live or die, who makes those ultimate decisions. And then, for the one path of my flight is direct through the bones of the living, one path. This hawk is totally unswerving. It has one goal and it will achieve that goal no matter what, straight through the bones of the living. That's such an incredibly violent image of the hawk tearing into um, a, another living creature. And again, no arguments assert my right. I don't need to argue. I'm in charge because I am. Uh, again, another sign of tyranny or dictatorship. And of course, all through this poem, we've got this idea that this hawk, yes, it's a bird of prey, but also it's a metaphor for particular types of military leaders. Perhaps we could think of Hitler or Stalin or other 20th century um, leaders who, who ruled through, through absolute fear. And now let's look at the last stanza. I love this line, the sun is behind me. Now, on a literal level, the sun, it, it will be behind it, setting perhaps, but also if you're behind something, you support it. And I think here, the hawk is so arrogant that it believes even the sun, um, the supreme giver of life, um, of nature, um, you know, supports his claim to powers, power. Nothing has changed since I began my eye has permitted no change. Again, total power. And the poem again closes with, the, with, with a, a line beginning with I. Once again, the personal pronoun I. And the, the poem is quite, quite like a cycle. It goes back to the beginning again. 
this hawk will do everything to maintain its power into the future for as long as it possibly can. OK, let's have a quick look at the, um, the structure of the poem before we finish. One of the things you may notice is that the many of the lines end with a full stop, if you can see or at least an exclamation mark, signifying um, what we call an end stopped line. Now this slows down the pace of the poem, but also particularly in this last stanza, where if you notice every line ends with the full stop, you will notice um, that it creates an incredibly certain and calm tone. It's really assertive. And this structural feature helps to support the central message of the poem, that this hawk is here to stay and believes totally in its own power. Um, it's very sinister feeling. Now, the whole idea of the dramatic monologue from the hawk's view helps, of course, emphasise its authority. It won't let anybody else's voice or anybody else's thoughts get in the way of its own. And right at the end, it ends with a confidence statement about the future. Uh, you know, I'm going to keep things like this. It's interesting that, of course, though, because we know that Nature never stays the same. Everything will die. Everything will lose its power. Yet the hawk doesn't realise that. And there may be a sense that Ted Hughes is almost poking fun at the hawk here. The hawk is, to be honest, one of the smaller of the birds, birds of prey. It really isn't much bigger than a crow. And so it, perhaps, you know, he's mocking this bird. And by extension, that would mean that he's mocking other kinds of military rulers, the Hitlers and Stalins, who believe that, that, believe that their power will last into eternity. And history has shown that, that that's not the case. It never did, and we can assume that it never will. Finally, just to finish, just let me turn that off. Just to finish, here are your key ideas, your key takeaways. This poem, yes, it's about a hawk, but it's also about the arrogance of absolute rulers. And an absolute ruler is a, a tyrant or a dictator. In the poem, animals it, or the hawk um, are used as mirrors for human beings. It shows us the psychology of cruel leaders their sinister nature, their ruthlessness, their violence. There is a direct link between this poem and Macbeth. Very much after Macbeth um, gains power, the rest of the play is about him trying to, to, to hold on to his power, just like the hawk with its uh, claws locked onto that branch. It's about the sinister nature of power, and also the non-romanticised natural world. Uh, you've seen a number of poems, and you will see a number of poems, which show a very romantic view of nature. In this poem, we see nature as being just as evil and sinister and cruel as, as, the, as humankind. Um, and last of all, violence. This is a poem that practically bleeds from the page in cruel, wanton violence. OK, well, I hope you've enjoyed that uh, brief uh, talk through um, hawk roosting. Make sure that you make notes on your poem. Do look back through the video and, and pause it. And do remember to ask your teachers any questions or queries you have about the poem or the work that you've been set. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And once again, have a lovely, lovely day. Enjoy the sunshine, even if it is just in the garden or through the window. Thank you. Bye bye.